Thank you all for being here at this event after a busy week. Thursday already. For some of you, it might have been exhausting during this whole week. But I'm glad you are here at this event, which is a tradition because it's already the second time we do this. <laughs> and hopefully it will continue. No longer business as usual. That is the theme of this event today. The role of companies, the role of companies, the role of companies to address societal issues like climate, mitigation and adaptation, like biodiversity, like malnutrition, like inclusive economic growth. The future, as some call it, of capitalism. How to measure, what are the right metrics to, me to measure meaningful progress beyond the narratives. CSR served its purpose in the past, but I think CSR should be in the core of companies, value creation for all stakeholders. Like the United States Business Roundtable recently announced with 180 companies that there is more value than just shareholder value. Although, with all respect to the United States, in some European countries, this was already incorporated in the law, even like in the country I'm living in. The ESM embraced already for a long time the triple P sold, people, plan, and profit. And we believe that the societal issues can only be addressed by governments, international organizations, and businesses. Since of most of the transitions, 80% of the investments will have to come from business, whether it is climate or malnutrition. It's an historic week with millions of people on the street, sometimes led by a young girl. Are we making progress? Do we see a change? Do we see a change of the next generation, what they ask from us being here? Gathering after such a long, leap, long week in this beautiful location, uh, I hope you enjoy it. We have several very distinguished speakers for you. We have Henriette Four here, and she will be introduced later on, the executive director of UNICEF, who understands fully the private public sector corporation, and I admire her work. But also from academia, Professor Rebecca Henderson, who also studied companies beyond their narrative and how their performance and their actions on sustainability fit together. Or Emmanuel Faber, who is also speaking this afternoon, this afternoon, uh, the CEO of Danone, who incorporated all of this strongly in Danone. And Vinu Kenne, of the Vice President Chairman of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And also from the financial perspective, she will give her view. And last but not least, all of you yourself. Because different than last year, we will give also a moment to have a discussion at the tables and discuss later on a little bit in the group what you find out, learning from each other. The host of today will be my good friend Vijay. Vijay Faichi Trawaran, uh, leading economist at The Economist, and Fiji, can I hand over the moderation of this whole session to you? Fiji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I'm indeed the, the US business editor for The Economist. And for many years, I was our energy and environment editor. So it's a real uh, a special uh, treat for me to be here today. Before I let you off the stage and we begin with the proceedings, Baike, let me ask you one question just related to the comments you made in passing. Uh, uh, the Americans in the room uh, would not have missed the slight dig at um, uh, perhaps the position that Europe is in, in taking the purpose of uh, companies uh, in the way that the Business Roundtable has now put forward. Um, what do you think uh, the gap sometimes in uh, attitudes and boardrooms in the US versus in Europe, or in regulation in the US versus in Europe? Um, uh, what do you think that gap means for global companies? Can you give a, a quick thought and on the way forward? Is there a convergence coming, or will they be divergent systems of doing things bottom-up versus top-down? 
I think the convergence has to come there, will be there, out of the self-interest of companies themselves also. If you do not incorporate sustainability, the value you can create for all stakeholders in your company, the millennials won't work for your company anymore, they won't buy your products anymore, you forgot to put a price on carbon, you lose your license to operate. So it is in the self-interest of investors, in the self-interest of companies to do that globally. And I think you will see a conversion. What is the importance, and Anna and I discussed that a few times this week, is many companies have a narrative, and we will discuss that today also. But I would like to know what is really happening under the hood. And that is the discussion we will have this week, and Rebecca Anderson will tell you something more about that. Um, the narrative is there. Are the actions also there? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Faike. Throughout human history, we have seen a tremendous competition between economic growth and environmental degradation. It's been called the great race. And historically, we've been able to come up with, in part through the ingenuity of business, the innovations needed to stay one step ahead. But I would put to you that climate change puts the great race to the test, the greatest test that we have encountered. And this is the challenge that confronts uh, us all. Um, Climate change touches everything in our lives going forward. And it touches everything The Economist covers. And I want to point something out to you, not in self-promotion, but in recognition of the topic, but also the uh, hard work of many colleagues around the world at The Economist. In, first time in 176 years, we have done a themed issue this week on climate change, the climate issue. I recommend it to you, please, to not only to recognize the issue, but the depth of reporting and the complexity, the differences around the world in approaching this topic, um, to, to, to let you know how seriously we also take it. But also the question of business and society, of, of purpose. What is the purpose of the company? We're gonna dig into these, and I'm delighted among the many corporate leaders, we also have, I think, the leading voice of clarity on this topic. Rebecca Henderson from Harvard Business School is going to speak a little bit later. So we're very much looking forward to her comments on this. Um, I wanted to start by, letting you know today, people outside this room have had enough of the blah, 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 right? That is the perception of what goes on in these grand halls and this week. And so they want to see action. They want to see the coming together, the learning which is going to happen here today, including some tough questions should be asked and some lessons learned, but then to go back and actually act on these. And that, that will be the challenge put to all of you when you go back to your capitals and to your headquarters. What are you going to do with this heightened level of awareness, of connection that we're doing today, with the elevation, which is only right on a topic like this, to, to feel like we're coming together to perhaps uh, affix to a purpose, to think about the best ways forward. But the challenge will be on you to take it forward. To help us think through those issues today, I want to, uh, first of all, make an uh, announcement that we will remain safe. Uh, I've been told as a housekeeping note, uh, should something happen in this room, and I don't mean just a heated conflict, but something uh, in terms of a physical emergency, uh, uh, please think about exiting to that side, which is where we entered, which is the, the, the main entrance coming out on 42nd. There is another entrance on this side, which will take you through the loading dock. I've been told, and I'm saying this verbatim, tell them not to fall off the ramp. So there is a ramp you will exit on that side. Please be careful if the need should arise. Now, we, we have no such plans for such an eventuality. We want the fireworks to stay in this room so that we can have spark our imaginations and come up with better solutions to these problems. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome the first of our speakers to give a brief intervention, uh, Henrietta Four, uh, Executive Director of UNICEF. May I please invite you to the stage? Please give her a nice round of applause. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank Feike. Uh, it is extremely important when you have leaders that care about issues and are able to articulate them with a vim and a vigor and a purpose and a clarity that makes you want to follow. So, Feike, thank you for leadership at DSM. 
Uh, and I want to thank everyone for organizing this event. Uh, DSM and SNL have both been longtime and critical partners for UNICEF. We together support better nutrition for vulnerable children and for mothers in a number of places around the world, but particularly in Nigeria and in India. It's a great example of the kind of a partnership that the world needs as we seek to shape a better, healthier, more vibrant and cleaner world for all. We cannot reach the SDGs without all of us, public and private sector alike, joining forces. At UNICEF, we are determined to join our expertise and global reach with what the private sector can offer. Ideas, products, innovation, services, platforms, market reach, research and development, and expertise that can promote and support the lives of children and young people around the world. In fact, the businesses have always been part of UNICEF's story. And we want to do more. In fact, we want to do far more. We are embarking on an organization-wide approach that we are calling Business for Results. We want to engage more systematically with businesses and with programming that benefits children at scale. And that includes young people. As you may know, our Generation Unlimited Partnership, or GenU, as they affectionately call it, is bringing together public and private partners around a common goal, that of ensuring that every young person is in education, is in training, or is in age-appropriate employment by the year 2030. New investments to connect every school in the world to the internet. We think this is possible in the next four to five years, and it will change the digital divide that currently exists in the world. We also want to change to quality curricula. Six out of 10 children and young people currently in school do not leave school being able to read a simple paragraph and comprehend it, so they cannot read, write, and do basic mathematics. We want to change that. We want to modernize curriculum. These are new initiatives to train young people and train the schools in the skills that young people need for the future. They'll need digital skills, and they're going to need green economy skills, and they're going to need to be digital, forward-looking farmers. These programs give young people um, mentors, and it gives them hands-on experience in the world of work. Businesses can help us, and to the businesses among us today, I think you would like to help us, so please join us. After all, today's young people are tomorrow's consumers, and tomorrow's employees, and tomorrow's innovators, and tomorrow's leaders. As we increase employability, we increase economic activity. And we see a particular role for the food industry, especially as you move more towards sustainable food systems and focus on environmental impact across the food chain. DSM has taken on this challenge directly with a new business model that aligns perfectly with GenU, how to create environmentally sustainable food system that delivers nutrition, economic growth, and jobs for younger people while positively impacting smallholder farmers. This is an opportunity to work together to train young people in the green farming industry and to build the workforce of tomorrow. Businesses will benefit from their ideas and their energy. Economies will benefit from more economic activity. And most importantly, young people themselves will benefit by gaining a hands-on experience that they can use to start building their careers in the workforce and in the industry. To bring this forward, I have two key asks. And so let me start with one for FIKI and DSM. So DSM is currently helping to reach 30 million people with UNICEF, WFP, and the UN family. So would it be possible for DSM to commit that we could reach 100 million people in the days to come? <laughs> so we're getting a nod and, uh, and um, a, a, 
I, I think maybe it's a yes. So, so I hope you all will come join us and come help DSM meet this goal of uh, reaching 100 million people. And then second, um, could all of you put a particular emphasis on apprenticeships and internships that would help give young people the skills that they need? You know, sometimes you take our world for granted, but if they could even just job shadow you for half a day, and your employees, if every employee could take on one mentee who just came for a day of work, they would see a world that they have not seen before. And they might get some ideas and want to become entrepreneurs. They might want to be part of your supply chain, and they probably would love to work with you. So um, thank you. Thank you for thinking with us. And please come to join us. Thank you very much. I must say, um, the old expression is there's no such thing as a free lunch, but you've certainly turned that around on the host. So I think uh, uh, kudos to you on that, uh, the ambition that we're talking about. Um, you, uh, I want to just ask one question. Um, you mentioned the apprenticeships and traineeships as an ask, but you talked a lot about scale. There's a lot, there are a lot of business people in this room and others who will hear your words here. Um, what would you like business to do to help you scale the things that you're talking about? A specific ask. All right. All right, thank yes. you. Okay, so we've got a third ask for you. Um, so this is help us scale. So under Generation Unlimited, what we've done is we've curated and filtered through a number of programs that we think that could go to scale. Um, digital learning, where you have hub and spoke schools out around the world, I think could move to almost every country in the world. We need ed tech. We need you to gather around it and try to get us there. We've got prime ministers and presidents all over the world who are calling for what could business be doing to help us. So um, we need money. We need expertise. We need products, services. We need technology. We need your people. We can use volunteers to help get these systems scaled up. So thank you for letting okay, me ask a third thing. Thank Excellent. you, everybody. Henrietta. Thank you so much. Let me uh, invite next uh, Emmanuel Faber, CEO of Danone. Please uh, give us a few words. Please give him a nice round of applause as he makes his way up. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Faker, for hosting this uh, great event. Um, talking about making things different and purpose-driven companies, I'd like to say that uh, the first outrage that happened within Danone history about this happened actually uh, literally uh, more than 50 years ago, or actually close to 50 years ago, when the predecessor of my predecessor, I'm only the third CEO in 60 years, um, said that uh, this company would pursue a dual economic and social project, and that was in 1972. We've been trying to do our best ever since, but talking about The Economist and uh, their great covers, the last outrage was last year when uh, there was an article that, in The Economist that said Danone rethinks the firm. And there were questions about me as a CEO and my role that were so much read by your readers, my friend, that I had questions during our investor day about how much I like money or not. In, <laughs> and I think, I think that's basically one of the topic. Because I couldn't say that we're seriously into purpose if the big bonus that I get every year is only driven by the financial performance of the company. And for the last 10 years, we have put in place incentives in the company that makes that every team leader around the world has a three-tier three bonus, one on performance, one on management, and one on social uh, responsibility overall. My personal bonus, and that's public, is 40% related to the performance of the company, 60%, sorry, related to the performance of the company, and 40% is on innovation, including the reformulation of the recipes to get them to a better nutritional status, uh, CO2 footprint, the reduction of 12% of our CO2 footprint last year, and the implementation of a program where we have associated all our 100,000 employees 
to the governance of the company last year. They are all shareholders of the company now, and they also have a voice about the agenda of the company, which is SDG related. We call it One Planet, One Health. There is only one planet, there is only one health. And the solution for food is about uh, the link between the two. So we are looking at food models where within the planetary limits, we need to shift the way we eat, the way we drink. And I think it, that would be probably my last words. If there is anything to take as a purpose-driven company um, in this new environment, dare to go for radical transparency. We still had this week conversations with some of you actually, uh, including some of you, where I heard people say, we need to simplify messages to the consumers. They don't understand this and that, and that's basically how GMOs are not labeled in this country. We decided in the country that we would label GMOs. I'm not afraid to get the consumer, quote unquote, which is you and me, basically, uh, confused about understanding what's real in the food that they get. Um, if we don't do this, they will find a way to do it. You know, the youth is probably more educated about climate today than we are, uh, us all in this, in, in this room. And so we need to upskill people instead of continuing to try to believe that we can send over simplistic message and that we'll get away with it. We won't change the food system without a radical transparency. And radical transparency means upskilling our people inside the company itself. So we develop modules where people understand the limits of water irrigation, of intensive agriculture. Why are we so much on salt and so much on sugar and whatever? And then we share with outside, because today already, Extension Rebellion is part of your younger employees. They are, they are everywhere, and activists are everywhere. We're all activists. So it's not like the old world where you, you had the inside of the company, the outside of the company, and a big, big corporate bill. That corporate bill does not exist anymore. So the one thing to change things in the future, whether we like it or we don't, is the radical transparency. It will be there, and I think there is a big opportunity to actually proactively ride that transparency, and this would be my small contribution to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you you've given us a couple of the, the keys to how you approach this. The commitment to purpose, you talked about uh, aligning incentives for managers and employees, uh, and you even gave a, a percentage, 60% on the management and the 40% on the perhaps closer to social purpose innovation driven goals. Um, I want to hear what is the biggest challenge in implementing this? What's the hard, hardest part? Is it getting that ratio right between daily execution and some of the longer term goals that might take time to pay off? What, what, in your own words, what's the hardest challenge? Well, the, the, the hardest challenge is, is clearly uh, the pace of change, uh, which is you know, do we change fast enough or, or do we change too fast? And there is no alignment in the company about this. Clearly, the young people um, see the fact that we are on a path towards uh, becoming a B Corp. We are actually, in this country, uh, the largest public benefit corporation in the US and therefore in the world. Uh, that's a talent magnet. Uh, and they are joining this company because of that. But then there is the middle management, and there is me. I mean, we've been trained in doing things in a different manner. So it's a, it's a radical shift for all of us collectively, and I think the mindset is probably the one thing that's most difficult. And you cannot force purpose into people. Uh, the, the, I mean, what's amazing about purpose is that it talks to the soul of people, not just the one part of our brain that's been educated to do the math. Um, and because of that, it does not need much time, but yet you have to have the patience to wait until this eureka moment happens for everyone. So it's, it's, a very, it's a very special way of driving change that has to be people-centric, and that's for me the, the biggest challenge, is, uh, is making sure that we go the right pace on this uh, and, and having people understand that they're aware and that therefore authorized to change things within Danone because as the CEO, I authorize that space for innovation, for risk taking uh, in, in addressing these topics. Very good. Thank you. Thank Please you. give him a round of applause. My pleasure.
Okay. Well, now, um, as uh, Faiki promised, there will be time for table discussions on these topics. Uh, I just want to leave you with a couple of the, uh, the questions that have been put to you by our two speakers um, thus far. One was really on how can business help scale some of these objectives? Uh, what, in concrete terms, can be done? And we just heard about the challenge of culture, if one can call it that, um, changing an organizational culture towards purpose and uh, getting everyone involved and the role of the leader in that. So we've gotten two meaty ideas that, that have been put to you by our, by our speakers. Uh, I invite you to discuss them uh, over lunch at your own tables. Thank you. Um, I can tell, having walked around the room and uh, listened in on a number of conversations, uh, the energy and the uh, excellent ideas sparking around the room. Um, we're going to try to pick up a little bit. We can't get every, every uh, thought that was expressed, but at least to give a flavor. Um, I'm going to ask for a couple of comments to give us some table feedback uh, that we can take back to our own uh, companies and organizations. Let me first ask if... Um, uh, Eugene Williamson from Pepsi is here, yes indeed. Let me ask you uh, to give us a few uh, brief comments summarizing the nature of your conversation. Sure. Thank you. Sure, Fijay, uh, with, uh, with pleasure. Um, so we had a heated debate, I would say, at our table, uh, and uh, especially around the first question. To be honest, we didn't get much farther than the, uh, the first question, but uh, we were able to discuss also, I think, the, the role that uh, especially businesses can play uh, in an era where trust in uh, the major institutions is being eroded across uh, the globe. Um, what we uh, discussed at our table is that especially uh, large companies, uh, multinational companies that operate across uh, boundaries and borders, uh, have a special responsibility these days to actually pull their weight and drive some of the required changes uh, across society taking a broader perspective than just the uh, pure shareholder perspective, um, and with that, um, take over, uh, in some cases, the role that governments and other institutions uh, have to play. Um, at our table, um, there was also, I think, a, a very relevant point of view, which, um, which said that governments actually need to continue to play their role. And uh, fortunately, in, uh, in many countries across the globe, uh, governments continue to play that role. In some countries, I think there's an opportunity for governments to step up and, and really play the role that they're supposed to, uh, to play, uh, wh whether it's from a regulatory perspective, uh, but also when it comes to really driving some of the, uh, the most profound changes that are required in today's era. Um, when it comes to um, some of the uh, most pressing issues, um, someone at our table, uh, Geraldine actually, um, suggested that we all watch, uh, I think it was a BBC documentary that recently Sorry? WWF uh, documentary that recently was, uh, was produced. Uh, and the, uh, the, the title of the documentary is Our Planet, Our Business. And uh, it's, it's a 45 minute documentary which basically gives a perspective on what's happening to our planet with a population, a population uh, doubling in a matter of a few decades. And of course, that puts a lot of pressure and strain as we all know on the natural resources. Business actually can and is playing, I think, uh, a crucial role now uh, to uh, address some of the issues that uh, that, that brings uh, with it. And I think we heard uh, Emmanuel uh, speak earlier today about the need for, uh, for transparency. Um, I think that is something that uh, many large corporations, including the uh, company that I work for, take, uh, take at heart. Uh, and as we do that, I think we can uh, really drive uh, some of the, uh, the changes uh, needed and uh, yeah, fill the gap that some of the other institutions uh, have, left, uh, have left behind. So I think that's more or less what we discussed. And uh, as I said, we, uh, we did stick with question one, uh, but I hope that I also gave you a perspective in terms of the seriousness which, uh, with which some of the businesses take their responsibility. And of course, FICA with, with DSM, I think, is, is leading the charge in, uh, in many ways. And uh, we're happy to, uh, to follow in that. Uh, in that same um, um, kind of strategy uh, to drive that, uh, that change. So thank you, Vijay. Great, thank you, Eugene. So we heard underlined, in addition to the, the role of business, uh, once again, we heard, for example, the theme of transparency. 
uh, you know, uh, the light of sunshine sometimes is the best disinfectant, it has been said. Um, and we saw recently, in fact, uh, Pope Francis convene a gathering of um, uh, oil companies, including among the biggest oil companies. And one of the things that they agreed to, in addition to carbon pricing, uh, was that uh, they, uh, to transparency, to look for more transparency and push for uh, the impact of, of climate on their own businesses. Let's see what's implemented in practice, but the power of transparency can be quite strong. Um, let's turn to Josette Sheeran. Josette, you are head of the Asia Society, formerly head of the World Food Program. Let's uh, hear from your table. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, first, I want to thank Faiki Sejma. I will say when I headed the World Food Program and wrote the lead, the opening to the Lancet series, that showed that a child who didn't have nutrition in the first thousand days, their brain would never recover in their body. I called Feike immediately. I said, what can we do? Because the World Food Program's 30 billion meals a year have no nutritional content, just cal caloric. And he put all his scientists to work and we invented the sprinkles that uh, for a penny or two literally transform that food. Feike, you've been a leader, you've been on the front line, you've brought your board and your shareholders and everyone along. We're honored to be here with you. Thank you. And I want to thank my good friend Eugene Williamson uh, under Indra Nui. Boy, they went to bat to really change a corporate culture and what Pepsi represented in the world. And I remember when I got the huge food basket of all the nutritional foods that Pepsi was putting out. And I know the new CEO is committed to the same track. So great leadership in Pepsi, including needing to move shareholders and the culture dramatically. So we had a great table, uh, great participants, uh, all living this work. Uh, how do companies go to scale? So first of all, that businesses can't do it alone. They need their competitors there because there's a cost to this. And you need to change the culture of rewards for companies and shareholder attitudes toward what is shareholder value. So you know, really needing to, to get companies to move together uh, after the pioneers. Um, that we don't have time left for opt-in. There is a sense of urgency at our table and that voluntary standards and approaches like that are great, but you're still swimming upstream, and it doesn't provide the right push and incentive for companies to change the way they think about shareholder value or incentives and bonuses. That there need to be agreed on metrics and incentives contingent on the, um, human health and the environment that would be adopted, like in Danone, that was a great report, that bonuses are contingent on that in part, and also you know, for all employees and how you change those incentives. We had a discussion about how Europe is quite a bit further ahead of the US on this and in changing the approach to how you think about companies and shareholder value. And the US has a very different attitude toward that. And so the need to understand the operating environment in different countries and how you move this issue in those different environments. In particular, in the US, that we're less long-term focused with companies and the short-term focus and something as simple as not putting nutrition or food or human health right at the center, but talking about ending quarterly reports was something that one of the founders of Zipcar, one of my favorite companies, put forward and just change you know, what CEOs, the kind of pressure they're under for those quarterly reports. Once you focus on long-term thinking, you're gonna think about the environment, you're gonna think about water, you're gonna think about health. Um, that we need, however, at our table, the agreement, a new, new forms of capitalism, that we've come to the end of this era. And in order for the planet and people to thrive and survive, we need new forms. So among those mentioned, were regenerative capitalism, circular capitalism, co-competition, cooperation with competition, and all of those things. Can I do question two? Uh, you, have, you have a minute, okay. <laughs> briefly <laughs> on how do we change the culture. Uh, what a chatty that, table. <laughs> that we need to change the culture in business, politics, and the populace. It's not enough to change one of the cultures. The goal should be that when there's a choice between people, planet, and profit, it's okay to choose people and planet. So how do you create the culture for that? 
Uh, we need to be careful of magical thinking, at least in the US, there's a lot of magical thinking. If only politics change, then everything will change, and then the environment will change, and the laws and regulations, and uh, that necessarily may not be true. So to really look at what consumers could do, and particularly cities, so Philadelphia just passed a tax on sugar, maybe that kind of local level politics is uh, important. Okay, Thank you. we will leave it there. Thank you, Josette. Can I have your mic? I will, yeah. So, uh, uh, important reminder that um, to rethink our paradigm. We're gonna hear more about uh, purpose and capitalism from Rebecca Henderson, so refrain from comment on that. We heard again about incentives, incentives for leaders and companies. I just want to underline one point, though, that's the operational challenge. Uh, it's one thing for the CEO or senior people to have some of their bonuses coming from social or, uh, uh, let's say, uh, climate or other goals. Um, it's quite different to operationalize it throughout the organization. In my job, I talk not only to CEOs, but also uh, people on the front lines. And I often find there's a disconnect between what might be very virtuous and sincere talk at the top and policies and what people face operationally quarter to quarter, sales targets, bosses that don't get it or don't want to get it, see this as a nice to do. And so, uh, uh, as I say, I, including today, from a leading company that's a champion in this area, someone who is not at the top told me, this is hard at my own company, even though my bosses get pro profit shares and bonuses based on this. So just to give you, a, a again, something to chew on uh, for the, when you go back to work, how do you operationalize it throughout the culture of a company? Now, we have just a little bit of time. I wanna hear from a couple more people whose tables maybe had something different to contribute, not to repeat what we just heard, uh, and then we'll go to the remainder of our program. Maybe I will pick on someone at this table. <laughs> Hi, Earthrun Cousin. Uh, I had the privilege of serving as a successor to Josette as the executive director of the World Food Program. Um, avoiding duplication, as you said, let me just raise a couple points. We were really bad. We didn't look at your questions at all. We just had a really good conversation. A rogue group. Um, so we'll, I'll just roll with what we talked about. Um, and I think I'll start with, when we talked about the issues of food and health and the challenge of consumer demand, we too often, as a community of leaders, say that it's too complex for us to be honest with consumers about the, their, the food system and the brands and the consumption and the, um, <clears throat> the what is what is in their food and we often use complexity as an excuse to avoid transparency in how we communicate and so we said we need to make it simple but we need to not substitute simplicity and transparency and embrace the complexity in honest terms and recognizing that not all consumers are stupid. And that there is, if, if, the, if these young people haven't taught us anything over the last weeks with their understanding of what is necessary for us to address the climate challenges, it is that they do have an awareness of what is required to make a difference in the world. And we have a responsibility, as corporations have a responsibility, as leaders, to embrace that understanding and provide them with the information and data so that they can make the right choices and they will lead those who don't understand. As opposed to trying to talk to the lowest common denominator. Let's educate those who want and are prepared to receive that complexity and allow them then to bring forward the other, the, 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 the community as a whole. And, and then I just want, I think it's important that we also, I wanna underline something that Josette talked about with the financial incentives. Too often, we, corporations, I ask the question of, how do we get every corporation to be like DSM and Danone? And to take the risk that's necessary. And now the journey that Pepsi's on. And the, the answer was simpler than what I, th what I imagined it was. It was that our incentives are misaligned in our corporations. And corporations are rewarded for those quarterly earnings. 
and they make decisions that are short term when they know that that may not be in alignment with what is necessary for the long term change. So financial reward is a significant factor in driving the change holistically across the corporate community. Great. Thank you. So a reminder that incentives matter. They make a difference. Uh, and, I, and I would, again, underline not just at the top, but throughout the organization. And the initial point about complexity. Uh, don't shy away from it. I would, but that does mean sometimes you have to acknowledge there will be trade-offs along the way. Not everything can be a win-win-win. So there might be situations where you have to look for uh, the ideal and then say, we, if that's not achievable, let's go for the, at least the, the very good. So embracing complexity, respecting consumers, uh, I think these are important insights to, for people to think about as well. Okay, I think it is now time to invite Rebecca Henderson of Harvard Business School to give us a talk about companies and purpose. Please give her a nice round of applause. Good afternoon. My guess is everyone in this room is really glad they're not me. Why? Because Vijay and Feike have told you I'm going to tell you how to reimagine capitalism, what the solution is, and summarize everything, and they've given me 15 minutes. So um, you should, I think you should be glad you, you're not up here. But nonetheless, being an enterprising kind of person, I will try. So, my name is Rebecca Henderson. I am British, as you can probably tell. And because I am British, I am obsessed with change. I spent my early 20s in England, working for McKinsey, closing plants in northern England, trying to understand why large organizations couldn't see the change that was coming at them. And I spent 20 years at MIT as the Eastman Kodak Professor of Management, studying large companies, watching change come towards them down the track and doing nothing. So I have good news and bad news. The good news is we are in the midst of the most important change facing the private sector in the last 100 years. And the good news is most firms can see that happening. That the old assumption that you could put your head down and maximize shareholder value is no longer enough. That you need, at the very least, to be aware of the broader environment, that it has enormous implications for long-term profitability, that climate change left unchecked is going to be terrible for business, so is inequality, and so is the kind of institutional destruction we're watching on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the good news. More good news. It's fairly clear what individual firms can do and do now and do profitably that will not only feed the bottom line but also make a big difference. I teach a course called Reimagining Capitalism, Business and the Big Problems. When I first started teaching it six, seven years ago, there were 28 students in the room. Now there are 300, and I've been invited to lead the required first year course on leadership at the Harvard Business School because this material is so central. The students are on fire about these issues. But they have the same questions those students seven years ago had, those 28 students. They had two questions. The first was, nice rhetoric, Henderson, how do I make money on Monday morning? You want me to be a purpose-driven firm, you want me to care about stakeholders, can I really run a firm that way? And I think we now know that the answer is certainly yes. One of the great statistics, and forgive me those of you who might have seen me uh, talk here a year ago, I cite this statistic a lot, but let me say it now. One of the really interesting statistics is that in the average industry, the most productive firm is more than twice as productive as the least. With the same capital and the same labor, the firms at the top 10% in the top decile are making twice as much output as firms in the bottom of the decile. 
I spent 20 years in windowless conference rooms at the National Bureau of Economic Research trying to make this result go away. Economists hated it. It's like, what do you mean? What is going on? Well, what's going on? Mumble, mumble, management. Mumble, mumble, leadership. Mumble, mumble, trust. And what we've seen over the last five years is an explosion of research exploring how purpose, how having your employees internalize the purpose of the firm gives you very significant ability to be innovative, much more productive. Why? Because you can tap into intrinsic motivation, a long-term feeling of meaning, to very high levels of trust in the organization. So we know that it is possible to be a purpose-driven firm and survive financially. We know what the business models are. We know that focusing on risk, reducing cost, becoming more efficient, looking for new sources of demand can drive sustained economic growth. We have examples in the room. Just look at the long-term financials of Danone and DSM and Unilever. Strong firms doing very well. So I can now answer the student's question, what do you do on Monday morning? And some people looked at the new announcement from the Business Roundtable and said, well, that's very nice, but you know, can it be really implemented? Absolutely it can. That's the good news. You're waiting for the bad news part, aren't you? Here's the bad news. It's not enough. If every firm in the world became purpose-driven and paid attention to its stakeholders and did the right thing, it would make an enormous difference, but it would not fix climate change, it would not fix inequality, it would not address the political problems we face. If firms continue only to focus inside the firm, it is not enough. We need at least three additional steps of change. The second step is rewiring finance. How many people in the room have financial backgrounds? How many of you think that moving to a place where every financial analyst understood that focusing on the long term and on purpose and using rigorous ESG metrics would make a difference? How many people believe that to be true? That's not nearly as many as I'd like. Um, it's an important first step. Supporting firms in becoming more purpose-driven by rewiring finance is absolutely fundamental, but it is not enough. Some of the firms we face are gen some of the problems we face are genuine public goods problems. Let me take the example of Clean Cow, one of DSM's ongoing projects. Um, fascinating technology. What Clean Cow does is reduce methane emissions from cows. Perhaps you know how important that is. It turns out that emissions from cows play a very significant role in driving greenhouse gases. Clean Cow is a fantastic product, but who's going to pay for it? The farmers are going to pay for it? Well, they have other things to worry about. The customers are going to pay for it? Well, they have other things to worry about. Now, DSM being an incredibly enterprising and well-run company, um, I'm not on the payroll, um, is finding customers, is finding um, firms in the food chain that for all kinds of reasons are willing to embrace a uh, product like Clean Cow. But if we had a price for carbon, it would be much more successful. You could drive that much faster and more easily. How many firms in this room are trying to raise their minimum wage? I just heard that Bank of America is already paying at more than $15 an hour and is uh, thinking perhaps of, of raising that further. I work a little bit with Walmart where they're also trying hard to raise their minimum wage. These are fantastic initiatives by individual firms, but unless everybody does it, unless everybody moves, it's going to be very hard for firms, particular smaller firms, firms at the bottom to do anything. So my students say to me, their second question is, okay, purpose-driven, I got it, fabulous. But how are we really going to change the system? So fortunately, I have the answer. Six minutes. First step, collaboration across industries, and Eugene talked about this um, in his remarks, is if firms can come together and say, 
all of us in this industry will address this problem. None of them is a competitive disadvantage, and you can make real progress. Think, for example, about the palm oil, the Alliance for Sustainable Palm Oil, or the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, or some of the coalitions in human rights, or in conflict minerals. When you have firms working together, um, they can all do the right thing. I happen to know that Pepsi is a major contributor. I'm, whatever I said, Emmanuel, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, if everybody agrees to buy sustainable palm oil, then nobody is disadvantaged. We can fix the palm oil problem, right? <sighs> yes and no. Yes, because once you get a group of firms working together like that, trying to take child labor out of their supply chain, trying to drive education in their region, you can make enormous progress. That's fabulous. But what we're finding is it's not enough. Five years ago, when I first started working in palm oil, I thought you guys had it nailed. I thought it was going to be fine. Most people, I think, hoped it was going to be fine. But it turns out that in a world in which you're competing with um, countries and firms that are not as interested in making a difference, they'll come in, they'll do things at the margin you don't like. That, alas, even cooperation without the help of government will not be enough. And so the bad news I have for this room is that without changing the broader culture, not only in finance, not only in business, but more broadly, to rediscover government that is inclusive, government that is supportive of capitalism, but is appropriately setting the appropriate rules, we will not solve these problems. Capitalism is not free and fair if major externalities like climate change are not properly priced. Most firms, are, if, you, if you count up the, the social costs of the emissions that these firm, that firms are generating, often that's the same order of magnitude as their profits. Uh, climate change, as you know, imposes huge negative costs. Without a proper regulation on carbon, we cannot have free and fair capitalism. If many people cannot play in the capitalist system, if my healthcare and my educational prospects are so constrained by the zip code where I'm born that I cannot be an active participant in the world, capitalism is not fair. It's no wonder that we see a major backlash against capitalism. I went to one of the climate events and I saw uh, young people saying, um, the solution is revolution. Down with those capitalists. They've coined, they've, uh, they've coined the atmosphere for their own personal benefit. This is enormously destructive. We need to rediscover that capitalism needs to be in balance with government. The development economists have a word for this, and those of you who know this well, forgive me summarizing it a minute. It's called inclusive institutions. The great triumph of the West was capitalism in balance with government. Government that was democratically elected, that was truth-based, that had a free media where elections were open. That's what we need to solve these problems, is the rediscovery of the partnership between business and government. So that's the bad news because it's a hugely difficult thing to do. But let me close, because I promised you 15 minutes, by saying I believe it to be eminently possible. Indeed, I believe it to be vital that not rediscovering this partnership will lead to, um, oh golly, I don't want to sound overly rhetorically extreme, but all my reading in history leads me to believe that if we cannot fix the institutions, we are looking at, at chaos, and that would not be good. So, um, so how can this be done? Uh, Giselle and Emmanuel um, and Eugene all talked about public-private partnerships. My guess is every firm in this room is deeply engaged with local government or the local state in one way or another in driving positive change. And that is fabulous. What we need is to begin to think about scaling that up. 
not only advocating for the policies that will make a real difference, like a price for climate change, but advocating for free and fair elections, advocating for open, transparent, and honest media, advocating for inclusion of all citizens and real minority rights. The deep structure of our governments is fundamental to our success as a society and fundamental to our success as firms. The good news is if you're a purpose-driven firm, you have an economic interest in doing this because you're investing in products and solutions and your people in ways that can only be enhanced if the bottom feeders that are still out there get away with behaving the same old way. If we're in an environment where we're looking at, instead of inclusive capitalism, extractive capitalism, where the rich are seen to capture all the benefits for themselves, um, that's not good for business, that's not good for you. I have a friend who's an entrepreneur in one of the major Eastern European countries, which is in the midst of some political difficulties, and he's been able to build his firm from nothing to about $80 million. And he said, you know, Rebecca, I, I, I can't build this any bigger because the government will take it from me. Um, we don't want, I mean, I know that sounds extreme, but business has a very strong interest in good governance. You're going to ask me what it looks like in practice. What it looks like in practice is being very clear that one is not partisan, but one is for democracy, one is for appropriate regulation, one is for inclusion of all kinds. Has this ever happened before? It has. There have been several moments in history when society has been on the edge of fracturing and the private sector has sat down with government, with civil society, and with other actors and said, let's build a society that works for all of us. A capitalism that is free and fair, a democracy that is open and just. This I believe to be the major challenge facing the private sector. I think the move to purpose makes it eminently possible. Let me close by saying I'm on the board of a for two Fortune 500 companies, so I know what I'm saying is like, whoa, Rebecca, that's like, excuse me, you know, like I have to go run the business. Um, <laughs> so I understand that I sound grandiose. I understand that I sound out there. The reason I'm saying this, I think this is vital. I think if we do not move in this direction, we face very bad outcomes, and if we do, we will unleash a wave of change and passion and economic opportunity that no one has ever seen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you. Um, we're going to have a, a panel discussion with Rebecca as well uh, as uh, Anne, if I can ask her to please come up, I'll, I'll introduce her as she comes. Anne Finucane, Chairman of the Board of Bank of America Merrill Lynch Europe. Uh, if she can make her way to the stage, and as you can see, we're just getting set up for a moment. But let me ask Rebecca while we're waiting. Um, you have certainly sounded a clarion call. Um, you alluded to previous moments of uh, intervention by the private sector. Can you give us one example that people would, uh, that would resonate with people? Is there something you had in mind? Yes, no, I, I have a couple in mind, so thank you for asking. Um, I think one of the best examples, and I hesitate to say this because I'm sure there are people in the room who know more about this than I do, but is what happened in Germany in the 40s after World War II. Right. So Germany was basically leveled. It was quite clear that the old ways of organizing society and, and the economy were not going to work. And uh, the German uh, private sector that had historically been unwilling to do this, sat down with the, employ the unions and with the government and basically designed an economic system in which everyone was trained, everyone had a job, right. um, there was a minimum wage, uh, wages were negotiated collectively, and there were processes put in place for ongoing consultation with the government to sustain that system. I'm not saying the German system is perfect, but it's noticeably less unequal than many other systems and noticeably robust. And that process, I mean, another one, just 
30 seconds? Sure. Because this is actually one of my favorite ones. Um, some of you may have heard about Denmark, and you know, some people say Denmark is socialist. I actually think Denmark is amazingly capitalist. They have a very strong capitalist system, but they train everyone. If you lose a job, you get very strong training. Where does that system come from? That comes from a strike in 19th century Denmark. Some people say, well, the Danish are like that because like, they're all naturally lovey-dovey cooperative. No. <laughs> Denmark in the 19th century was going zoop. And um, the uh, Danish private sector said, whoa, we need to really change this around. And they sat down with government, and they designed a process, and it worked a treat. So we've definitely done this before. OK, thank you. Please, let's have a seat, and okay. let's dig into this a little bit further. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, and, and thank you for joining us. Um, you've heard Rebecca's uh, comments. I wonder if I could ask you uh, for your reactions to that uh, as a leader in finance. Sure. Um, well, we had an occasion to talk a little bit bef beforehand as well. So uh, the banking industry is an interesting one because it too um, has probably changed out of chaos. We were in uh, obviously a very bad shape 10 years ago. In our company, Bank of America, we made the decision to just look at everything and like a, a taking all of the parts out of a car to reassemble the car uh, in the aftermath of, ma uh, math of that crisis. So that today, um, I believe that uh, the, the sort of mandate that the Business Roundtable put forward, and, and perhaps uh, it could have been done a bit better, but, th but the idea that uh, it isn't just shareholders, it's, it's more, uh, the stakeholders are greater, isn't really uh, becoming woke. It is, it is uh, a recognition that our future depends on our employees, our communities, uh, and uh, future shareholders. So just in very practical terms, uh, we are at, uh, we did announce a few years ago that we would be at $15 an hour. We will be in the next 18 months at a $20 minimum. So that is a beginning of making sure that there, uh, nobody is living below the poverty level. I mean, just to be very basic about it. 40% of our board are women. 50% uh, of our executive management team are women. Uh, and those kinds of, that kind of diversity, uh, about roughly 30% of the board is also diverse, but that kind of change allows for uh, more people to speak up, to uh, impart what they think, and to debate. And once you get that going, it really changes the dynamics. So that um, when you hear it from the business roundtable, I think that is an expression of what we're experiencing. You're meeting with investors, Three years ago, four years ago, if you said ESG, that was a reason for the portfolio managers to get up and get their cup of coffee while you talked. Today, they have three people across from you, and they're asking you exactly what you're doing in terms of carbon neutrality, minimum wage, diversity of your workplace, uh, what are you doing in terms of lending and investing in the environment. Th this is a huge change. Can I, can I press on that a little bit? Um, uh, your bank is clearly an American bank. It's uh, in your name, but you head up the European part of it. Um, my, I'm, the I'm also the vice chairman of the bigger company and oversee the ESG. So, you, you see, you see the, the full perspective. Right. Um, uh, the question I wanted to ask was the following. Um, it gets back a little bit to what um, I brought up at the beginning is about the transatlantic divide and attitudes on this topic. And I want to ask both of you to comment. Just yesterday, um, uh, my colleague that covers Wall Street and I, she sits a couple of feet from me, we were discussing um, how striking it is. We get the analyst reports from all of the banks between us uh, on all these industries. And the ones that tend to have a strong focus on climate, sustainability, ESG, the kind of argument that, Rebecca, you put on the table, uh, come not from European banks. It's not the origin of the bank. It can be uh, a Goldman Sachs or BOA. But it comes from the analyst in London or Paris. Uh, and the ones that come from New York often disagree. There might be another sector analyst who takes, a, uh, uh, let's say, a traditional finance-focused view. So we're seeing this in the financial community, even at the level of analysis, and we're certainly seeing it with um, social impact investing, the numbers. I wonder uh, which direction is that going? Uh, Feike talked about a desire and a need for convergence. What are you seeing very much de entrenched in finance and, and Rebecca, you churning out the future financiers. I'd, I'd be interested, is this overblown? Is this not a big issue? Or is this a really big issue? 
I'm not sure I'm understanding. Is it the analysts being from Europe or America, or is it that the, the perspective, the view from London or from, let's say, continental Europe, is different on this topic than it is in the U.S.? And so you're asking, is it overblown? How big a deal is it? Right. Is this okay. a problem? Is and, this really a big? Deal? And even within individual institutions, is my point that where the email comes from and where the person sits appears to color how importantly they take these views. And there may be some self-selection, of course. Uh, even Americans might go to London or to Paris and then maybe take on a portfolio that's more important to that office or that region. Yeah, so I don't think it's the analysts. I think, right. I, I do think though, remember that only in America is the issue of environment political. And that's, therein lies the difference. So everywhere else that I'm aware of, it is not a political issue, but it's a political issue here. Our president has chosen not to pursue the uh, Paris Climate Accord. So it already causes uh, some diversion, shall, shall we say. I would say this, uh, so I'll just, I mean, Bank of America, like JP Morgan and the other big US banks, we're global banks. We have some of the largest market caps and the highest profits in the world. Um, I mean, we're bigger than most other entities, period. So um, that, if we ignore this, it's a terrible um, issue, and if we embrace it, I really think we can move things forward. Our analysts have proven that to make, a, uh, to make an investment in the environment, and I'll give a couple of examples, or even in women, changes the complexion and the long-term uh, value of a company. So in real estate, if a real estate um, uh, companies or syndicate uh, is looking at the environment. They're going to build their buildings differently. They're going to be more energy efficient. They're going to have better long-term value. That's a fact. That's no longer a nice to do. That's not political, it just is true. And they have the facts and figures to show it. Now we have the trajectory over a 10 year period to show it. Mm -hmm. We can also do the same in terms of uh, institutions that embrace women, have more women in the marketplace. It's not only good for the community, but we can demonstrate in real, facts and figures. So where the analyst is doesn't matter. It is, uh, do they have a track record they, they can prove? In the financial world, what we're seeing is that if you have an investor community, so the business roundtable making this statement, we have an investor community now that's asking us what we're we doing. What are we doing to uh, uh, lower attrition, both with customers and with um, employees? What are we doing in terms of carbon neutrality? not because they see it politically, but now they're seeing these reports and recognizing this is just how you run a company. So I actually think there's a difference between business uh, seeing it as uh, political and politicians seeing it as political. And for instance, we signed up during the um, financial, uh, during the uh, climate uh, accord for a $125 billion commitment to finance environmental efforts. We've already done that. We did it uh, well in it. I thought we would be done in 2025. We're done this year and we'll now, uh, we've just re-upped for $300 billion by 2030 and we'll blow through that because it's now actually a competitive opportunity. We're the largest underwriter of green bonds in the world, not because it was a nice to do, it's good business. So we're, we're reaching some tipping points in some of these areas. Because it's good business. Right. I mean, it, Americans are capitalists. We are affected by, is this business or not? Becca, what do you think about this question? Um, at Harvard, I spend a lot of time talking to large groups of executives. Mm. And 10 years ago, when I talked about this, as you say, the Europeans were much more engaged than the Americans. Now, everyone in the room, with the exception of about 10% from some geographies, but nearly everyone in the room is exactly agreeing with Anne. They have sustainability programs. They can see everyone is looking for growth. Everyone is looking for growth opportunity. Everyone is looking for employees. And the students are on fire with this. If you right. want to hire someone, the best people in the world now, the best young people in the world, want to work for a company that's focused on these issues. Mm. Plus, you're looking for growth. You're looking for new opportunities. These shocks are you know, new markets that are out there. So I'm seeing seeing this go much more mainstream. I think it's slower in finance than many other sectors, right. paradoxically. But yes, it was focused in Europe, but now I think is, is worldwide. One of the points you emphasized in your talk was um, that business, even if every business got on board with purpose, as discussed, it wouldn't be enough. You need government as the setter of rules uh, and uh, dealing with externalities and so on. Is there a danger 
that uh, the push, for example, from the Business Roundtable and uh, others to expand the remit of the company to take on so many of society's problems lets government off the hook. Oh. And how do you deal with that? Well, we know we need government in order to do, I mean, some of the, particularly in the environment, in order to stand up a wind farm in the North Sea or um, consumer solar in 30, 40,000 homes, you have to have um, uh, the government, regulators, uh, rating agencies, and financial institutions come together. We have, though, seen uh, some of that blended finance so that um, those kind of efforts 10 years ago we wouldn't have done too big a risk and low margin. Today we do them, but we don't do them by ourselves. It is actually a uh, collaborative effort amongst asset managers, development banks, um, organizations like the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations, and then commercial banks coming together, development banks coming together and all taking a, a tranche uh, with uh, different horizons and different expectations in terms of returns, but on a collective basis we can make it happen. When a local government participates, it goes forward. When they don't, it languishes. So I would really reinforce that, that paradoxically, firms taking a bigger mandate, mm -hmm. when they step into that space, they go, whoa. Yes. <laughs> so let's take a, a concrete example. When Nike and Levi tried to get child labor out of their supply chains, right. they thought they could do it by auditing, and they could do it, and business could do it. And it soon became super clear that unless you could persuade local governments to enforce their labor laws in places like Honduras or Vietnam, you weren't going to be able to, 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 to solve this problem. And so they started working with local governments. Even in this country, those firms who are really engaged with education, you just start working in that area and you're like, whoa, we need to work with local community colleges, we need to work with the local, the mayor, we need to work at the city level. I thought you were going to a different question, mm. which is the risk of democratic subversion. Mm. That if you give business too large right. a role. That is there also. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think that's an issue. But that's why I think it's so important to be purpose driven and to be explicitly focused on the good of the society and to be focused on building strong institutions so you guard against that risk. Because, of course, that's a worry. It's like, well, yeah, I'll fix this problem and uh, I'll fix it, you know, the way I want. <laughs> In a way that suits my business interests. Exactly. Right? Right. Right. That's, all, that's not a problem we have yet in the U.S. It's the opposite problem. Right. We have the opposite so, problem. Okay. I'm going to come to the audience for um, some questions. So please get your questions ready. We're going to have microphone runners. Who, I'm going to um, give you a moment to think about your questions um, and ask one more uh, myself. And that is, um, uh, in talking about, um, uh, I think you call them bottom feeders, companies that are looking for that extractive approach. Um, Free riders, let's say. How do you deal with the free rider problem when companies that are virtuous, that want to do the right thing, do step forward, but there will always be some short-term opportunity in not doing that? Uh, have you thought of a way to deal with that issue that doesn't unfairly punish the company that moves ahead or the, not create a first-mover disadvantage? I, I thought that's, what, that's why I was going on about government. So is, bring, government, is, is, bring is along it, a big friend, government. You, you need, right. essentially, okay. the problem is people will will we'll bottom feed. Right. And unless you have you know, transparent, honest government, that's going to be very hard to stop. Um, there are ways to do it. Right. Um, you could try, you could ask the asset owners to enforce that everyone in an industry behaves. So I know this is not next year, but we could imagine five years from now, the big funders saying, unless you do X, Y, Z, we won't fund you. Right. And, and really taking care of bottom feeders. And that might happen. I'd be very curious whether Anne thinks that might happen. I think it will happen. I think there's, yeah. a, there's a, an element of that now, which is a supply chain. So in the supply chain, you start looking at who your vendors are. Are they diverse? What are they doing in terms of um, minimum wage? What are they doing in terms of uh, environment? You are not there to regulate them. You're not there to judge them. But you can also choose not to use them. Right. So again, power, in a sense, through the marketplace. Right. Yeah. Uh, great. I had promised some questions. I see there was a, a lady at the cent center table there. Uh, just a couple of ground rules. Please identify yourself and make it a, a short and yeah. sharp question. Hi, this is Alice Korngold. Um, f phenomenal presentations. Uh, I totally agree with your comments 
and Can you hold your mic closer to your mouth, please? Yes, Perfect. okay. Thank you. About the balance between business and government. My question is, what happens, and maybe it's what you meant by democratic subversion, but what happens when <coughs> there are capitalist forces that overwhelm the democratic process and government, maybe fossil fuel companies, and subvert it so it's no longer possible to get back to a balance? Is that, is that a concern? <laughs> so, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think one of the trickiest things is we need the private sector to advocate for limits on its own behavior, for campaign finance reform, for radical transparency, if we're to build a system that is <coughs> truly in balance. Um, and that, that's a hard ask, but I think it's the right ask. I have a question here. Again, please identify yourself. I'm Anirban Ghosh. I'm from the Mahindra Group in India. A little louder, sir. Thank you. During this climate week, even as we are talking about stepping up ambition and action, I heard that companies from an industry who are choosing to lower their carbon footprint and emissions are likely to be sued for, collision, for collusion. Is this for real? If it is, how do we deal with it? Okay, so uh, I'll repeat the question as, as I best understood it. Uh, correct me if I got it wrong. Uh, companies that are committing to lower uh, their carbon emissions or their foot, uh, reduce their footprint uh, are at, maybe at risk of being sued for collusion or anti-competitive activity. That's the gist of the question. Uh, is, uh, maybe we'll turn to Rebecca on this. Is this something you're hearing about? Yes, I am hearing about this. Um, and uh, for example, with the uh, Coalition for Sustainable Palm Oil, they have antitrust lawyers in the room for every meeting. Um, but fortunately, in US law, for example, we have a history of permitting collusion if it's in the public good. One of the best um, examples of that is Semitech, which was a coalition of semiconductor manufacturers that got together to support the development of semiconductor capital equipment. So yes, this is an area of ambiguity in the law, but there are many good reasons to think that it can be relatively easily addressed. Um, although it, it must be said that depends on uh, the good graces and intent of the current administration. Yes. Uh, those of you who follow the auto industry will know that at the moment, an attempt for this sort of positive collusion with the state of California by several automakers is um, under threat of investigation by the uh, Trump administration's Department of Justice. Uh, on exactly antitrust grounds. It may be only a threat at the moment, a political threat, it remains to be seen, but this does produce a, a wrinkle in, yeah. in the it, it, in It's the a argument. real issue. It's a real issue, yes. Uh, great, let's come to this side, and uh, please, let's keep the good questions going. Hello, my name is Anoop Chagwani. I'm with the International Finance Corporation. The question is to Rebecca. Uh, you did talk about bottom feeders and setting a standard so you kind of create an industry benchmark. How do you think of that in terms of companies being of different sizes, small and medium enterprises saying, hey, look, this doesn't should apply to us. We, we lead on the environment and social front, and, and we struggle to bring some of the smaller companies up uh, to meet some of the uh, standards that we set. How do you look at it from across different geographies and different size of firms? As you know, I'm sure, because you asked the question, this is an incredibly difficult and intricate question. Uh, let me give you a first pass answer which is many very small firms and enterprises are badly run. And one of the reasons they, are short, they take shortcuts and they don't manage well is because they lack what we would think of as basic managerial tools and basic managerial practices. So I think if we're going to start enforcing standards on smaller companies, it's very important that we simultaneously give them support in learning to manage well enough such that they can gain the benefits of managing in this new kind of way. Um, so I think it's possible, but we'll have to be carefully phased in. If I could just add something, which is for the larger companies, we are um, evaluated by a lot of third parties. Some create frameworks, some create rating systems. MSCI, Sustainalytics, CDP, GRI, Dow Jones, and uh, they take public comp uh, information or they ask us to respond to it and then you hope to get a grade that is better than the rest of the industry. But as a company that gets a grade better than the rest of the industry, it isn't really um, helpful in terms of setting industry standards because it's a lot of third parties coming at you and Fike and I are um, 
involved in a, a project with the International Business Council, which full disclosure, um, our CEO and chairman, Brian Monahan is the chairman of, of looking at can we create for industry in general and then by industry types, a sort of lead certification. So I'm using that as a very simple and crude framework. But are there a certain amount of things with complete transparency you must show that you have done uh, and they are absolutely transparent. You have or haven't done them. I mean, you, you prove that you have or haven't done them. And can you uh, do this in the macro, all industry, and then by division, so that there is something that everyone can look at and say, so they are carbon neutral, they are doing a certain minimum wage, they are either um, doing this or not doing this in terms of the environment or philanthropy or whatever it is that the criteria will be. Because in lead certification, you get lead certification in silver, gold, and platinum based on very specific criteria, and you can't kind of fudge it. It's, it's very specific. I think we think that that would be a way of leveling the playing field for all industries and getting to this transparency that everyone seeks to see. Great. Let's go here. There's a question from a lady. Thank you, Geraldine Matchett. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of DSM. Um, now to the topic of rewiring the financial system, which is something I'm very passionate about, uh, and linking it to the bottom feeders. Uh, mm -hmm. I would be very interested to have your opinion on how far can some of the new dynamics around cost of capital go. And I'll give the example that uh, we managed to raise with our RCF, our revolving credit facility, uh, 1 billion with 15 banking institutions where the cost of the capital is linked to us delivering on our greenhouse gas reduction ambition of 30% at absolute terms. And recently, NL just uh, announced a bond uh, where the interest rate is actually linked to their installing the installed capacity, I think 55%. Now, to me, this creates very practical and easy way of differentiating from those who are trying to have the right impact versus those who are not. Uh, but how can the banking institutions really scale this and make it going from the anecdotal to something very sizable and very scalable fast? Well, I think we're trying. It started with the underwriting of green bonds. The way the underwriting of green bonds goes, it's essentially the same as a government bond or a municipal bond. It's a low return, but in the case of green bonds, you have to demonstrate the outcome. It, I mean, the, the value of it is only demonstrated by the outcome. That was the beginning of this business. And um, since that, it's been tax equity or issuing green bonds or this concessionary financing of rewarding and, and um, rewarding in terms of interest rate or fees based on these outcomes. And it's becoming competitive, which is what you want. You don't want just us doing it. You want Goldman doing it and JP and BNP Paribas, but that's happening. Um, and the reason the banks would do it isn't for that one particular thing. It's because we, of course, want all your business. And um, if you have a good experience there and you feel that this is a trusted relationship, you'll do more with any of the um, individual companies. So is this it a is loss leader, can I ask? No. I mean, there, at first, yes, you were, it was concessionary financing, but green bonds was a good example of you really weren't making any money, except you started making money when you would then win other parts of the business because they, they felt that you were a trustworthy business. But you see it evolving from that, clearly. Oh, yeah, and it okay. is evolving. It is evolving. Great. A quick follow-up on that. Yeah. Sorry, if I can, whoops. Let's get the mic back on. Yeah, if I can just bounce back on that. Isn't there a link which goes beyond, which is companies who are doing these right things are intrinsically less risky, and therefore your return on capital deployed is always risk adjusted, and therefore it should never be seen as just a gift because you do other business uh, with this corporation, but as something fundamentally linked to the nature of the companies that you are uh, serving. Sorry are, for being a bit let's provocative. Let's ask Rebecca, are, are well-intentioned companies less risky, always? So, in general, they are less risky. Where I think you want to go, Geraldine, is that well-intentioned companies are better financial investments overall. I think there are two problems with that. I, believe me, I wish I believed it. Um, 
but there are two problems with that. The first is, if you're a genuinely purpose-driven company and committed to stakeholders beyond simply your shareholders, in order to be authentic, you have to occasionally demonstrate that. <laughs> you have to make decisions that are not immediately purpose maximi uh, profit maximizing. Because if you never do, if you're, only profit ma if you're only committed to purpose up until it's profit maximizing, like no one is going to believe you. So there are genuine costs of being purpose-driven. Purpose and trade-offs. And, tra and real trade-offs. The other problem is, alas, sometimes bottom feeding is risky, but hugely profitable. Um, it just is. And so I think, as I look at the research that's out there, there's some very nice evidence that some pu purpose-driven firms are overperforming, but in general, they perform no worse. Well, I think that's a fabulous result, right? I mean, if we can show that doing the right thing, it doesn't give you lower results, that's fantastic. And for some firms, like DSM, like Danone, when you do the numbers, it is lower risk and they will perform better, fantastic. But I think we have to be careful of the, oh, just manage this way and everything will be fine. I think, I think that's dangerous. Right, but if you, if you look at DSM as an example, it's well managed in many different ways. It isn't yes. just that. Right. And um, that's what you're talking about is emblematic of how you th see things, but it's part of a whole. And the whole, I'm sure, is um, well managed from A to Z. And that's th those are the companies that are going to last yeah. that are well managed yeah. A to Z. I think going back to this idea of uh, shareholders, it's just it can't just be the bottom line. But we were talking earlier. We do need the investors, particularly the pension funds, to. S I mean, they are saying it in in your meetings with them, but they have to declare it more uh, broadly, I think, for it to be, at least in the United States, something that really can leap forward. We have just a moment for one last quick question. There's a lady there with a the microphone. A short question, please, and a short answer. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, we uh, can. My name is Hadia Shirazi. I'm a graduate student at Columbia studying sustainability management. And um, it's a question for maybe both of you. Um, as a young person, as a millennial, you know, you get talked about a lot. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm, I didn't go on the protests on Fridays because I used the, pro, the, the Fridays to actually do the work that we need to do to move the needle forward. Um, so not all of us are just angry and out there, you know, protesting. Um, but we are concerned about this fact that for the companies that are not Patagonia, that are not NG, that are not DSM, um, where, when is it going to be? Is it 2025, 2030, 2050 that we have that conversation about the basic economic problem of how do we allocate our scarce resources towards the production of goods and services that are for the good of all? Um, because there might be some companies that would have to really consider, do we need to produce highly processed foods and sugary drinks? Because looking at the levels of obesity in the United States, Brazil, China, um, we are heading towards an unsustainable future, no matter how brilliant and bright we are, sure. we can't take that on. A powerful question. Um, I'll ask either of you who wants to take it. Rebecca, do you want to field this? Very, very quick answer. When I first started teaching sustainability and working with big groups of executives, they would look at me like this. Nice theory, Henderson. What I'm finding now is that the level of concern about what's happening in the world is, is building to a, to a space at which people I would never have imagined are saying, you know, Rebecca, I always thought the sustainability stuff was bullshit, but all my employees want me to talk about it, and you know, I'm really worried about what's happening in the world. And I'm beginning to think I really need to change. So I can't give you a date, but I can tell you that the world has changed enormously in the last five years. That the appetite for thinking about these questions and talking about these questions is really shifting. And that the companies that are, that are leading edge are so much more innovative and so much more fun to work for that they are attracting the people that, uh, that will make the difference. So I like to say that I am hopeful but not optimistic. Optimistic is, don't worry, everything is going to be fine. I think it's clear that we need to worry, and it's not clear everything is going to be fine, but I am hopeful. 
I think we are in the beginning of the shift, and I think it will accelerate. All right, Rebecca, on that note, we're going to uh, give you the last word for this panel. Please join me in thanking uh, both of our stellar speakers. Thank and thank you very much. I, I'm going to, uh, and I invite you to step down. Pike, uh, I, I will invite Pike back to the stage uh, to give some final remarks and bring our uh, lunch to a conclusion. We'll get a, a podium up here as well. I think you'll agree that was a, a thought-provoking uh, session as promised and much to discuss further. Pike, the floor is yours. Thank you all. I will keep it short to close this meeting. We heard from several people that it is not business as usual. Most speakers, not by coincidence, were female. I am here, by the way, with three members, the three female members of the executive committee. We have three men, three female uh, colleagues. You heard already Geraldine, our CFO, also our HR, and our Chief Innovation Officer uh, is here. Why do I say that? Because we need also different perspectives, different perspectives to solve and address the problems of the world like we discussed this afternoon. The fact that the richest, and we all belong to that billion people in the world, consume about 45% of all resources, and that the other six billion have the access to the remaining 50% of the resources. Is that sustainable, or will that continue? No. Or the fact that today 9,000 mothers will lose their children in their own arms, and that it will not be in the newspapers, for the simple reason that it happened yesterday and will happen tomorrow again or the fact that we are addicted to our fossil resources and address the climate change not fast enough, and already four years after the Paris Treaty, signed by 200 governmental leaders, we are derailing and we are not on track. We need to address that. We need to address that with a different perspective. Some of you asked in the break, what do you focus on this week? Let me address a couple of things. We address this week as DSM, especially the things that we are good at and where we have competences, and that is on climate and on hunger. Those two areas, we believe we have competences and can contribute. We published last Saturday the report on putting a price on carbon, and together with Anand Mahindra, we published the report that between 30 and $125, there is not a reason for governments not to put a price on carbon because you will not lose out competitiveness, nor jobs, nor economic growth. Or climate adaptation. We published this week also our report, chaired the commission which I'm serving in of Ban Ki-moon on climate adaptation and how to address best practices in all regions in the world. I would have not thought in 2015 when we signed the Paris Agreement that it would ever, ever serve in my life on a climate adaptation commission. I wish only to work on climate mitigation. But climate adaptation is a real thing for many people. The other thing was nutrition, and we have here amongst ourselves Amar Ali, who is uh, the CEO of Africa Improved Foods. And he won this week the Swab Foundation Corporate um, uh, Leaders Award, being really a social entrepreneur as we mean it with the world. Um, although I said in the speech, I expect, I expect that in fact all leaders are social entrepreneurs and all CEOs are social entrepreneurs and not only Amar. Like I said, 80% of the money of all these transitions, whether it is hunger, whether it is inequality, whether it is climate, need to come from the private sector. So, the role of business is very essential, and that is why we organized this session for the second time. What is the role of business in the economy? How did the economy ever start? Did the economy start by making money? No, the economy started as a distribution model of competences. One was better in catching buffaloes, the other was better in growing crops. At the end, we exchanged it. Simple model, that is the economy. 
Then a third and a fourth people joined the club. Then it became more complicated. We invented gold as an exchange tool. That became too complicated. We put gold in the bank and we issued papers and we do as whether well it is gold and everybody believed it. And then later on, we destroyed also the paper. We write it down in a computer and everybody believes that the money is there, although it is not there. <laughs> what I heard from the banks, only 10% of the money is there. The rest is not even there. It's written down in a computer. So money is just a tool. It's just a tool to exchange goods. So why is business, like Rebecca said, not stepping up fast on this? And I've said it a few times this week. Is it that after high school, all the bad guys went to business and all the good guys went to NGOs and governments? Is that the root cause of all the problems? No. There are bad guys in both groups. <laughs> Fill it in yourself. <laughs> but the good news, speaking with Rebecca, is that there are good guys, and ladies especially, in both groups. So what is the struggle of business? And we discussed also, the business, of course, is also constrained by their investors, by the system they operate in. Ah, so the problem is with the investors. No, the investors are locked in by the system. They work for all of us, pension people, who would like to have a return on their pension. So this is a system that we have built, which needs some revision, or we need some changes, because everybody is locked in by other people in the same system. But we need to think short-term and long-term. We see, need to think micro and macro at the same moment. But it might be good for your company, it might not be good for society as a whole, and at the end of the day, hurt there for all of us. If we can make those kind of changes, what PepsiCo is trying, what Danone is trying, what we are trying, what many companies in this room are trying, to build a new reality for our company, for our companies. We all in this room belong to a group which is called in the dictionary, the elite. Now, that is nice. We belong to the elite. Let's have a look to the dictionary what the elite means. That is those who are privileged. That's the upper layer of society. That's those who give steering to society. That is those who earn more than other people in society, according to the dictionary. The dictionary does not talk about the responsibility of the elite. I think if we want to be the elite of the world, or the elite of the world came together here during the UNGA week or the climate summit, then the elite have to show responsibility also. I don't want to lecture, and I don't want to have this organized to lecture anybody. We are struggling every single day, also in our company, to shape it in the right way. The only thing that we would like to do is to inspire each other. You inspired us by being here today and with your stories. Thank you for all the speakers, for Rebecca, for Anne, for Emmanuel Ferber, for Henriette Four, for being here and speaking. For also the interventions of Josette, of Ertrin, of Eugene, very much appreciated. And of course, Vici, for your moderation. 10 years ago, when, 13 years ago, when I started as a CEO, many people asked, so what do you want to do? And I said, running a successful company and improving the world, something like that, a combination of the two. Some people said, okay, then we can forget your stock. I said, no, well, I don't hope so. I just started as a CEO, so <laughs> if you now already say that, that will be my shortest tenure then at least. <laughs> now, after 13 years, I think we have proven that those two things can go to hand in hand together. But our philosophy as DSM is, if you look 13 years ahead, those two, things, those two things will have to go hand in hand together. And that means also that DSM has changed. DSM ever stood for Dutch State Mines, one of the most polluting companies in the world. We are not so Dutch anymore. For decades, we are not owned by the state, and the mines are closed. But OK, we kept the three letters. And I speak with the words of the Honorable Vice President of the United States of America, Mr. Al Gore, who said, does DSM not stand for doing something meaningful? Well, who am I to correct him? 
So I thank you very much for being here, being inspired by each other, and thinking as businesses together with the public sector, together with NGOs, how we can run our organizations in a successful way for the fiduciary duty we have, and at the same moment, contribute to society, since nobody can, nobody even should dare to call yourself successful if you live in a world that fails, and we can make it much better than it is today. Thank you very much for your attention and being here. Well, Faike, you've, you've made it impossible to follow on in any way from that uh, fantastic presentation, uh, which took us through from buffalo hunting through the history of capitalism, the uselessness of gold and where your money's disappeared, through to uh, uh, really a good summary of the themes that we've discussed. Um, all I will say is um, I think that we can agree that uh, this has been a thought-provoking uh, session. It really gave, I think, uh, a lot of intellectual grist, but also some practical ideas that you can take away with you to your companies as you try to do what is the purpose of coming together this, this afternoon, which is to uh, look at the, uh, what business can do to take on these great challenges. Uh, by nature, journalists are skeptical, but after this session, uh, I will uh, admit, and I think you will agree with me, that we've all gained hope. Uh, we won't rise to optimism, as Rebecca has warned us, uh, because that leads to some sort of complacency, but certainly we can leave here more hopeful. And for that, let us join hands and thank all of our speakers today. Great. Thank you. And have a good rest of uh, UN week. Good afternoon.